What's up, everybody? Today, we're going to be talking about chronic fatigue syndrome. So this is a syndrome that I really don't see show up in isolation on the boards. I would imagine they would throw this in a scenario question just as like another thing that's going on with the patient, just so you can kind of keep an eye on what's going on. Because by itself, really, the treatment is just take frequent rest breaks. Like that's really the only treatment that's like truly PT. But like, this is something that's going to be showing up with like another pathology. So it's going to have a friend on the boards. Uh, so let's just kind of get into it. Um, basically, the anatomy associated with it is the nervous system's response to stimuli. It is the nervous system is completely shot. It's overstimulated. These people also end up having some chronic pain stuff going on probably. So they have no, like, I, like, their system is just shot. That's pretty much all I can say about this. Um, the immune system also like deteriorates as well because this person's under a lot of stress. They're fatigued all the time. Their immune system suppressed. So again, this is somebody that um, might end up getting sick a lot. So don't be surprised if there's somebody that cancels a lot on therapy, uh, but they're also somebody who probably can't tolerate a lot of you know, activity just due to their weakened immune system. And then they're going to have a lot of musculoskeletal things going on as where they're, you know, fatigued, their muscles hurt, they have pain that migrates all over the place. They're, you know, tired, that's all going on. So they're going to have musculoskeletal pain as well. Etiology, who knows? I don't know. Maybe, you know, I don't know. So we're not sure what causes this. Uh, basically, it ends up being one of those diagnoses where they're like, well, we can't figure out what's going on. So boom, you have chronic fatigue syndrome. Yay. But we're going to see a lot of these symptoms mimic other things that are like bad. So uh, some things that they think might be a possible origin is going to be like they think it can. It's just, like some people will literally classify this as a type of autoimmune disorder due to the level of fatigue and then the, you know, basically sh like completely crapping on the um, immune system when it comes to they're unable to fight off infection because they're so stressed and just like, ugh, like think about how at the end of the semester, right before finals, like everyone gets sick because they're so stressed and they're just like dead or like right after finals, everyone gets like super sick because they're like dead or during finals. Who knows? Maybe you guys are sick right now listening to this if you're about to take the exam. Who knows? That's kind of what's going on. So stress will weaken the immune system. Um, also thinking that could be a viral origin. A lot of these unsure kind of diagnoses can be potentially viral because, um, you know, a, a virus uh, such as Epstein-Barr virus can cause Guillain-Barre. They realize that sometimes viruses can cause other problems in the body where they end up being immune system issues. Uh, the environment. So if you're in a stressful environment, yeah, that's going to cause problems. Um, age, sometimes people uh, respond better to stress at certain ages than others. Um, that's kind of the big thing. So like that middle age is where you really get super, super stressed out. And then if you're too, if you're really young, you're like, whatever, la la, I don't have a care in the world. And then if you're really old, you're like, F it, I don't care anymore. <laughs> and so like that middle age of people, that's where it gets really stressed out. Um, and then genetics. So if you're more prone to a condition like this, like you have a family history of it, they notice that that does kind of you know, travel along the family lineage. So what does it look like? So essentially they're going to have to meet a series, a like a series of these criteria to be classified as chronic fatigue syndrome. So here's the other thing. All of the imaging that they do has to be negative. Like a CT scan has to be negative. An MRI has to be negative. Any sort of imaging that they do on this patient or diagnostic testing must come up negative, which kind of ends up meaning that, oh, it's an inconclusive kind of thing. So I, I truly believe that this is one of those conditions that they just slap on people when they don't know what's going on. Um, so they must have six months or more of the following. So they have to have at least four of these criteria, plus the one that talks about severe long fatigue that is not relieved by rest. So difficulty concentrating with brain fog, forgetting things, memory loss sort of thing going on, um, and large lymph nodes, so cervical or axillary those tend to be the most common. Uh, migrating joint pain without inflammation. So again, a lot of times when we see true joint pain and like the, from musculoskeletal origin, you will see that the, it inflames, it gets, you know, red and stuff like that, or it just swells up. So this is just, I'm, I have pain right there, but there's like no inflammation. Myalgia. So that means joint pain, body pain, muscle pain. That's what we see. Uh, persistent slash recurring sore throat. That's one of the things that can pop up. And then general malaise, so just like fatigue, essentially malaise is just like, I, I don't know how to describe malaise just besides a feeling of just, uh, blah, a feeling of blah, that is malaise, uh, lasting longer than 24 hours after physical and mental exertion. So again, you know, we go to the gym, we feel pretty tired after going to the gym. So, you know, you'll feel tired for like 
maybe a little bit, but then like, you know, the next day you're bounced back and you're good to go. Or like, maybe, you know, you did a workout and you're like, man, I am white. And then like two hours later after you eat dinner, you're like, I'm, I got some energy again. We can do some other things. Like maybe not like intense, but like, it's not like you're completely down for the count. So that's what this means. And then a headache that changes in severity. So again, headache, um, not just like a migraine that's been diagnosed, but like it changes in severity. So what do these all look like? These could all be symptoms of cancer. So that's why all of the imaging and diagnostic stuff needs to be ruled out. You can't just have a patient come and say, oh, I'm feeling all this stuff. And you're like, ah, chronic fatigue syndrome. No, they could have cancer. So you want to get this all ruled out. They could also have MS. That's a big thing. Remember, we have a huge exacerbations after that. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much it. That's what's going on. So don't take one symptom in isolation. That's the big thing, guys. Never take one symptom in isolation. Uh, but again, those enlarged lymph nodes could be infection, could be cancer. You can't take just one thing by itself. It's got to be this combination with the negative imaging with the prolonged fatigue for long periods of time. So that's what this is classified. So how do we treat it? Really just focus on that big red thing there. It says frequent rest breaks. They're already tired, they're already fatigued. Give them frequent rest breaks. It's going to be the best way to get through the therapy session. The big thing though, for like the regular treatment. So is this like me clinician to clinician speaking, not NPTE teaching breed to you kind of thing. Uh, validate that the person does 100% feel like shit. I think that that is going to be a big component of making sure uh, you build that rapport with the patient because you have to say, I believe you. And that will make them like you a lot more and come to therapy and honestly gives them a better outlook so then they don't feel sad. So that's the biggest thing. Validate that the person feels like poop. Um, modalities can be used for decreasing pain as long as nothing's contraindicated going on with the patient. Um, low intensity exercise and stretching. That's the most important thing, low intensity exercise and stretching. This will be the most appropriate thing for this patient, making sure that um, we're not overdoing it. So frequent rest breaks, and then you're treating the symptoms as they arrive, as they arise. You, this is not a condition that you will fix. You won't fix this. You won't make it all go away. You're going to help the patient manage their pain and symptoms. So they're able to do their activities that they need to do in their lives so they can get through their work day so they can go to their children's like, you know, soccer games and not be mentally exhausted by the end of it to make sure that they, you know, don't have all this pain going on. And again, as I said at the beginning, this is not something that you kind of see in isolation. They probably have this condition paired with something else going on. So maybe they have a total knee replacement. Maybe they have, you know, a rotator cuff tear. Maybe they herniated a disc. Like something else is usually going on. And this is just something that else that is thrown in. So I can imagine this will definitely show up as a scenario-based question kind of thing, like maybe not definitely, but like if they're going to throw this in, I can see it as a scenario based question because um, it's going to be like a multi issue going on. So imagine the sample question that's coming after this is actually from a scenario. So just keep this in mind. Uh, this is not fibromyalgia. That is a completely different condition. Maybe some of you were thinking, oh, well, this is this what they call fibromyalgia now? No, that's different. And we can go down that rabbit hole another day, but um, I believe I have another video on this somewhere, but this is not fibromyalgia. It's not the same thing. Um, that is where you have specific pain points at specific trigger points on your body. So again, as I said before, because these symptoms look like concerning things like MS or cancer or something like that, if they worsen or they change, you're going to refer out and you're going to tell the PT. So basically you're going to tell the PT what's going on. They need to refer them to the proper person because that's what they went to school for to figure out who do they need to refer to. But um, yeah, if symptoms are changing and getting worse and, you know, that's not good. If they have this constant, just like, you know, I've had a headache all the time, I'm like tired all the time, like my throat's sore and like I have some difficulty concentrating and like that's just like standard. And then all of a sudden they get this like, oh, like I've been throwing up a lot more then you're just like oh that's not good so that's the red flag that you look out for uh but here's our keywords our negative imaging so they ruled everything else out it's not cancer they're like oh, i don't know could be anything malaise myalgia so that like blah and then the muscle pain fatigue lasting longer than 24 hours after an event physical or mental or whatever um rest breaks are going to be key so if it says rest breaks pay attention to the question as long as there's nothing else in that um answer that's making it say no so it could be just to make sure guys read the whole 
answer. And then if it has an unknown origin, etiology, or insidious onset, you're thinking more um, something that just slowly appears over time. And uh, we don't know why it happens. So sample question. So a patient is being treated for rotator cuff tear in their left shoulder. The patient is four weeks post-op. The patient also has been diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome and has a pacemaker. Which of the following activities would be most appropriate for this patient given their comorbidities and current condition? One, upper body ergometer for 10 minutes with a two-minute break at the five-minute mark. Two, passive, passive range of motion of the shoulder. Three, shoulder flexion with light weights and frequent rest breaks. Or four, interferential current to the left shoulder with ice to decrease pain. So give you guys a moment to think about that one. All right, guys. So the answer is going to be passive range of motion of the shoulder. So let's go why, over why the other answers are wrong. So remember, even if one part of the answer looks good, there could be another part of the answer that makes it not true. So we have somebody who had a rotator cuff tear. They're four weeks post-op. This is the acute stage of recovery, okay? So even though, like, I haven't said acute stage, like, the boards will say acute stage, but four weeks post-op, y'all know that person's still in a sling. They can't get out of the sling until six weeks. They are fresh. They're, they're like, one week post that primary prime time to tear their rotator cuff. So they are fresh. Upper body ergometer is not indicated at this stage. That is going to be way too painful for the patient. We are not doing it. It is contraindicated against every protocol in the acute stage. That is more something that they introduce in the subacute stage um, to, you know, increase endurance and repetitive reaching. During this stage, the primary focus is decreasing pain and increasing range of motion, mostly passive. So that's why passive range of motion of the shoulder, completely appropriate with everything. This is a patient that has a rotator cuff tear, and they also, you know, have this chronic fatigue, so stretching is good. Um, so upper body ergometer, not good for the, the rotator cuff, but that pacing of taking a break, that's still okay. I It probably will end up being a longer break, though. They want at least a one-to-one -one work to rest ratio, so they would have a five-minute break. That's more of what they want, that, like, one-to-one -one ratio. Um, shoulder flexion with light rate weights and frequent rest breaks. Okay, frequent rest breaks is great, but that light weights, we are not there yet. This person should not be lifting weights until about eight weeks out. So um, it's a little too fresh for them. So we're going to stick to some, you know, passive range of motion, maybe active assisted range of motion. They are not in a stage where they should do active range of motion yet. Definitely not with resistance. Um, that's going to be definitely probably around eight weeks that they would introduce that. So again, acute stage, no weights. Um, interferential current to left shoulder. That's nice to decrease pain with ice. Beautiful. Amazing. However, the patient has a pacemaker, so that's contraindicated. So you should not be selecting that option. Um, if they didn't have a pacemaker, this would be a great option, but they have a pacemaker. So we can't do IFC on their shoulder, especially because it's so close to the heart. So I hope that that helped you guys out. I hope that this helped explain what chronic fatigue syndrome is. Uh, I'll see you on the next one. And let me know if you guys have any questions whatsoever. Take care and I'll see y'all later.